Um, my panellists, please unmute yourselves. Jess is just waving at me to tell you to unmute yourselves. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick run through of what we're going to do, crew, uh, everyone who's listening. I'm going to briefly introduce the panel. My pa the panellists are going to briefly introduce themselves and then we're going to launch straight into some discussion, which I'm going to lead from the kind of uh, places that the panellists start with. Um, and then we'd be really keen for some questions uh, from the audience. Jess is going to throw those into the chat from Slack because remarkably for somebody who's an internet, on an Internet New Zealand panel, I'm very untechnical and I loathe Slack with all of my heart. So I don't like to go there. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's sort of how we're going to roll with this from here on in. Um, so hopefully you won't hear much of me talking and it will be my, the four fantastic panellists who will be mainly the speakers. So, nā mahi nui ki a koutou. Ko nā iwi o tēnei wāhi ki te nāti whātua o rākei. Um, behind my computer is the beautiful manga of Mangarei, uh, which is one of the beautiful manga of Tamaki Makoto, um, and I'm fortunate enough to work right beside it, looking at it when I'm sitting at my desk at home. Ko inis mon te motu, ko minator te maonga, ko te wera te iwi, ko hiu's taku ingoa tipuna, ko Kate Hannah a ho. From the biblical story of Susanna and the elders to Tolkien's and also Peter Thiel's Palantir, from the handmaid's coded greeting of under his eye has been both pious, and also self-protective, um, to New Zealand's overseer software, key to modern farming success. It is clear that surveillance or watching is at heart a power relationship, which tends to shore up existing structures of power. Who are those who historically are, in, and in current times, the most likely to be watched? And who is doing the watching? And perhaps more significantly for this context, for, for this Ficado, um, who is talking about surveillance, human rights and power? Decisions like today's one, I don't know what day it is in Facebook world, but today we'll broadly say today's one from Facebook around the removal finally of Holocaust denying content. They're made within closed systems within which nearly every decision maker has the subject position, the invisible subject position of white, cis and male. And so from the COVID card wearing analysis of the last couple of weeks and the problem that the analysis didn't take into account of these things called breasts or actually babies who are really, really keen on grabbing anything you wear around your neck um, and to the very names of things from, as I said, Palantir, Overseer, the issues with who surveils and who is watched are exacerbated by the really high likelihood that those talking about the watching share more with the watchers than the watched. Um, so this panel um, will attempt in many ways to broaden that conversation uh, and, and, and explore in the context as um, both Jordan and Andrew have really neatly summed up, this, the context of this utterly remarkable and flabbergasting year the year of COVID, the year of 2020, in which these conversations seem as pressing, if not more pressing, than they have ever been. Um, so I'm going to hand over to my panellists to introduce themselves, and also they're going to bring up one particular thing or story or idea that they'd like to bring into this conversation space now. And I'm just reminding my panel that we're going to go in the order of Kioni, Eve, Thomas, and then Sarah for introductions. So over to you, Kioni. Aloha kakahiaka. No Hawaii ahau o Kioni ko uinoa. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kioni. I'm from Hawaii. I'm the CTO at uh, Tehiku Media. We are a Maori organization um, who operate radio and online television. And recently, we've been doing a lot with machine learning um, and data science to help accelerate the revitalization of Te Reo Māori and other indigenous languages. Kia ora, aloha. Kia ora, kia ora, kia ora tato. Um, no otipoti aho i fano mai ki otipoti i tipaki o ki otipoti hoki. Engare he tangata tiriti aho no kotimana o kutipuna. 
Uh, kia ora tato. my name's Eve Kennedy. I work at the Office of the Privacy Commissioner and uh, I guess my one comment or story that I'd like to kick us off with is that um, I think that before we can allow intrusions like surveillance into our lives, we need to have a really clear evidence base for them. Seems uncontroversial. Kia ora. Hey there everybody, I'm Thomas Beagle. I work in tech, I'm the Chair of the New Zealand Council for Civil Liberties. Obviously, I've got a strong interest in surveillance and data collection, and particularly how that changes the balance of power between people, government, and corporates. Now, one of the big issues is the same tools that keep our communications private and maintain our security can also be used by criminals to do the same. Law enforcement and spies want access. And yesterday, our government co-signed a statement with the other five eyes partners, saying that they want the big providers to allow them to work around their encryption systems to allow them that access. Now, there's a whole lot to cover on this topic, but I want to leave with two points. The first is if the system is engineered so even one government can get access, all the other governments in the world are going to demand the same access. So opening up to countries like us, we're also opening up to repressive regimes around the world. And secondly, when it comes to the chilling effect that surveillance has on communications, the perception is often more important than the reality. We can talk all we like about justified access and warrants and oversight, but the many pe pe message many people receive is still, we're watching you. So my question is, how can we feel safe when we feel spied upon? Kia ora tato, kanoi te mihi kia koutou. Um, he uri o uh, te tai tokero no uh, ngati ko ngati kahurawa ko nga puhi o kuiwi no au nui me uh, motito a ho ko sera toku ingoa. Um, thanks for having me here. It's uh, a big topic, as Thomas said. Um, I apologise for the flickering. I have no virtual background going on. But anyway, um, I'm at Tech Futures Lab, the privilege of bringing a te ao Māori through a te tiriti o waitangi template view, bringing that to life to our postgraduate students that are wanting to future-proof their careers and be relevant in the world. Um, and I think the 1840 template was radical then and is radical now uh, for collaboration of power. Um, I'm fascinated by this topic of watched being watched, given, of course, as we know, that Māori um, have been the most evaluated um, community in Aotearoa since 1840 and evaluated by non-Māori. And it's no surprise, therefore, that we always end up in these strange statistics which tell stories that we feel are not right or represent us. So I'm pleased to be on a panel to help highlight that. And I just want to say what I'd like to see talked about is how do we bridge that gap, that chasm that exists between Māori and non-Māori, that great lack of trust that Māori have um, to trust of any Pākehā to do anything that's going to be for their good. Um, the solution in a Māori eye is have Māori there at every decision-making point. So I'd like to just see that. Also, one other last thing. This is a deeply personal topic for all of us. It's not about technology. It's not an abstract the theoretical conversation. This is our lives and the lives of our children, our nieces, our nephews, our grandchildren. And I really would love to see <laughs> everybody that has the opportunity to make any decision in this incredibly important digital technological world that they think to themselves, how is this decision going to affect my grandchildren? So, yeah, I just like to leave it there. Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe, Sara. Um, so, panel, I guess I wanted to start with thinking about something we've discussed in our various chats um, and, and moving from what Sarah's just drawn attention to. Um, if we're going to take te tiriti as the model for New Zealand, for Aotearoa, for the future, when we're thinking about the relationships between human rights, surveillance and power, you know, what might that look like? And um, I'd like to flick to you, Kioni, um, for what I know is probably quite a practical example of some ways in which that might be represented in the mahi that you are doing, but then also would really encourage the rest of the panel to join in. Uh, kia ora. Um, I guess, I guess for us, uh, we, you know, we're a Maori organization and we, we just, we lead by tikanga. Um, and well, we practice tikanga every day, whether we're at home, whether we're on the marae, and naturally we just bring that into the workplace. 
Um, and so when we have to make key decisions around um, how we look after data, um, then usually we just apply tikanga because that's what we know. And, and actually it's worked um, for hundreds of years, certainly for Māori and, and other indigenous people. Um, I guess for, I mean, uh, for us, Sorry, I work in I work in nonprofit and, and media, and, and I, I struggle to understand why I'm here to talk about human rights, surveillance, and power. But but Tahiki Media brings a really good indigenous perspective to this all, and and it's easy to think about surveillance as like facial recognition and cameras think, um, looking at us on the streets. But when you look at how indigenous people were surveilled over the last hundreds of years through colonization, it kind of makes you really understand what surveillance includes. Uh, one I want to particularly mention is blood quantum. Uh, so in America, um, the, the, the Americans have done this thing where you cannot, you basically can't fuck a papa to an iwi in, 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 a, in a Native American tribe unless you unless you have uh, a quarter of blood quantum, which is, is just absurd. And, and most, most Māori don't get this concept. But what really sucks is that growing up as a Hawaiian in Hawaii, being colonized by America, uh, we were normalized to believe that blood quantum is important. So quite often in high school, we would talk about, oh, how much Hawaiian are you? Oh, you're only 1 16th, you're only 1 64th, you're not even a Hawaiian. And that's something that the colonizer has instilled in us. And that's a level of surveillance by, by us surveilling each other in terms of how much Hawaiian are we and whether we have rights or whether we should have access to land because we're only 1 64th Hawaiian as opposed to 50% uh, or something like that. So I just I just wanted to throw that out there. Kia ora, kia ora. Um, I think that's a really valid point that you make, and also you know it's a, how it indicates the blood quantum kind of story. Sorry, as a cultural historian, I'm interested in that. Um, shows how the ways in which we collect data for things like surveillance or for, for government records then go on to culturally define concepts that um, could have ramifications for hundreds and hundreds of years. So the blood con quantum concept was a, an attempt to you know, measure something that needed to be measured by the state. Um, and it brings us, I think, quite nicely into what Eve brought up in her um, opening remarks around the clear need for clear evidence base for surveillance and, and for the use of data in developing surveillance techniques. So Eve, would you like to sort of chime in with some ideas on that? Yeah, absolutely. And look, I think you make a really interesting point, both Kate and Kione there. Kate, you just made a remark about the need for government to collect that data. And I guess my first question would be, well, was it was it necessary at the time and is it still necessary? I mean, yeah, if you think about the adverse impacts um, to Indigenous people as a result of that data collection and the normalisation of the importance of that data collection, um, I think it is really interesting to consider the, the need there. Um, from a kind of Privacy Act perspective and a privacy perspective, um, we also often see this with agencies who are kind of attracted to the bright and shiny, you might say. So, for example, we were consulted by a, an agency who um, had been approached by a vendor with, a, with facial recognition technology, and they wanted to use the facial recognition technology to count a queue length. Um, but they didn't need to know who was in the queue or who the people were, or actually all they wanted to see was how fast the faces were moving through the queue. So I think that's a really good example of um, this kind of idea of supply-driven demand in a when we're living in a time where these kinds of technologies are really, really available to any agency, big or small, to kind of roll out without thinking about it. Um, when actually that kind of surveillance and that amount of data collection is just jet there are, is unnecessary and there are absolutely ways that you could achieve the same goal without collecting that much data. Kia ora Eve, thank you. Um, oh, Sarah, I'd really like to bring you in here to uh, think about what this might look like in the world of, of um, digital technology and, and education. Mm. Yeah, sorry, there's a bit of a delay. Um, uh, what can I say? Well, firstly, just, you know, the, the Māori whakatauki kamua kamuri, which means always we need to look back before we leap, you know, look before you leap. 
And I just want to quickly tell one little story. And that was um, my grandparents in the 30s or the 40s um, had obviously been the recipients of a lot of research um, by, um, you know, Pākehā historians, anthropologists, sociologists. Anyway, they realised that uh, we needed to be able to tell our own stories, but at that time there was no... Um, oh, okay, sorry, I'm reading text as well. Um, there was, yeah, there was no ability for Māori to tell our own stories our way. So they knew that they had to get allies in and they found some one young woman who, um, to come and be immersed in the Māori culture um, which was a big deal because Māori didn't open doors very easily. And anyway, she came, she went on to be, um, her name is Dame Joan Match. She became the first um, woman anthropologist in um, Aotearoa. And she told me she had to carve her own way, but that own way was only given to her through the open door of Māori. So that's that's a personal story of how long this conversation has been going on. It's been going on much longer than that. And so today I get that opportunity to do what my grandparents couldn't, and that is I get to bring to life what Te Tiriti o Waitangi really was. And if you think about it in 1840, it was a radical template. It was already a uh, British government, so much literature that recognised that Māori were rangatira here in Aotearoa. There was no, there was no taking us over. It, so Te Tiriti o Waitangi was the gesture from Māori to do something they'd never done before. They were facing new technology, uh, new, a, a, a completely new horizon when they met British, who some of them were also looking for the new away from their own history and rigid and dogged um, traditions. And Māori did something. They put skin in the game in 1840 by saying to them, we will give you some of our own mother, Papatuanuku. We will let you have some of our land, and here's how we're going to do it. And it was the template of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And that was power sharing, if you like. It would have been revolutionary back then. No one power shared. Well, how much more today in 2020, when we look around the world and there are power grabs like crazy in so-called civilised Western societies, um, we're going back to the dark ages as quickly as ever. And it's, you know, thinking about Jordan, when he talked about plan B, what's our plan B? Well, I think I can say plan B is an indigenous perspective to lead us into our future. It sounds a little bit paradoxical, but it's not. We've never forgotten that we are connected one to another, one to our environment. And I think it's about time we could place Māori, and if we can't even place a Māori in every single area of decision making, I want to try and embed our, you know, encode some of our beliefs and ethics into minds of people who are open to think differently. Um, and just one last thing, in the middle of the night, I was welcomed into the World Economic Forum Global Futures Council for AI for Humanity. And they said, what we need today is some diverse, disruptive thinking. Business as usual is not working. So we've got nothing to lose in Aotearoa, New Zealand, to take on board um, to sit at your Waitangi. We've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. And quite frankly, I would love to instill confidence in the people that know how to harness great energy and power. We've got that deep in our DNA. I'd like, I would probably trust those of us who have survived colonialism and colonisation take us into this next round confidently, excitingly, you know, um, but together, you know, have a real partnership. We've already heard together through COVID. We've already been successful as Aotearoa team, Aotearoa New Zealand. Well, we could start to harness that kind of power again, um, but in every area of, of society. I'm sorry, it was a little bit of a rant and a rave, but I just feel so passionately about... 
seeing really in my heart is I want the dignity of Māori restored so that they can truly be the rangatira, um, even if it's just in their own lives. Um, yeah. So there we go. I don't know if that answered your question, Kate. Oh, kia ora, Sarah. That was just awesome. That, that was beautiful. Ngā mihi nui ki koe, Sarah. That was just absolutely beautiful. That perspective of, of the treaty, I think, nailed it. And it's something that many Pākehā would never grasp until you've made it so clearly. It's a shame that we couldn't see your face because of technical difficulties, but hopefully everyone was listening intently that Māori decided to share their power with the Pākehā. Hey, that's, that was, you know, yeah. in that sense of what you mentioned, and they just yeah. turned around and took it all. Yeah. Yeah. Kia ora, kia ora. I, That was absolutely kia ora. epic. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I think raises a really, really critical set of questions about what it truly looks like to do this from here. We can only make changes where we are. This is a huge, big global issue and problem, but we can start from here in Aotearoa. What can we do here? We can only do it in a way that is just, that um, embraces human rights uh, and talks about power in ways that it's about power sharing and balance if we are grounded in te tiriti. So I wanted to flick back to Thomas because he hasn't had a chance to speak yet and go back, Thomas, to what you were talking about in your introduction around um, those issues of, of law enforcement and surveillance um, and data collection, you know, the need for governments to um, catch criminals, uh, but also perhaps surveil populations. And, and just um, really appreciate your thoughts and then the thoughts of the rest of the panel on what that looks like um, if we are starting from this wonderful challenge, this wero that Sarah's thrown down for us around truly understanding what tetiriti means um, in this context. No biggie, Thomas, but, you know, give it a crack. Well, it does tie in well because I think that what we see in our surveillance and what we see in our laws and what we do about it is actually so much influence from overseas. I mean, the, yesterday's announcement that I mentioned is actually obviously driven by people who are overseas in the, in the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, it's not it's not part of what we're thinking. It's not New Zealand-led. And the same thing we've seen with the, the, uh, the, the over-surveillance of the Muslim community is, again, coming from that outside-driven. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to see is I want to see not a, a New Zealand approach, but a, what we could call an Aotearoa new New Zealand approach. We need to think about what we need and not just take on those, um, those external providers. And I believe that using that in the, in the, in the spirit of, um, of, of partnership and looking at the treaty and, and working out um, a more collaborative way of thinking about it, I think would be much more effective and will lead to both increased security and also increased freedom for everyone. Kia ora, Thomas. Mm. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think the, um, the, the, relationship, the, the bilateral and, and multilateral relationships that we have in the security and, and defence and, and other spaces are contributing to some of these conversations. Um, and I'm just really interested in how the panel, because this is what I'm working on at the moment, think about um, kind of the ways in which we do need, or people are monitoring or looking at disinformation and conspiracy theories, like I am at the moment, um, within the context of this idea of surveillance. You know, how, how do we balance out the need to understand what's going on with the need to protect people's individual rights? That's a really personal question for me because it's the work I'm doing at the moment. Um, Eve, I'd be really interested to see what you think from a Privacy Commission perspective on what we call in the business OSINT, um, Open Source Intelligence. That's a big question, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big panel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, look. Um, I mean, yeah, and 2020 is such a, what a, absolute pinnacle of a year for um, OSINT, as, as you call it, um, which is a new term to me, I have to say. Um, I guess if we're looking at it from a, from a privacy perspective, um, I mean, at its very basic information that's publicly available is publicly available, and, and therefore 
um, is subject to certain exceptions from, from the Privacy Act uh, in terms of collection and use of, of that information. But there's still, I think, um, discussion about intrusiveness and ethics of collection of that kind of data and um, the appropriateness to have that kind of surveillance. I mean, really at its heart, it, in the kind of privacy world, what we want to see is um, intrusions that are justified and demonstrably so. So, um, you know, that's the language of the Bill of Rights Act, which privacy itself is not in, protected by, but um, Section 21, unreasonable search and seizure is. So that language of a demonstrable justification before you can have such an intrusion still applies to, um, you know, the collection and use of, of OSINT, I suppose. Um, yeah, I think the ethics of it, though, is is a really big issue, which perhaps um, is is perhaps outside a little bit of my wheelhouse, and particularly in a utility or, or partnership space. Um, you know, that it's a it's a really big question as well. Kia ora, thanks, Steve. I wonder if anybody else has any comment on on kind of the the emergency nature of twenty twenty and what that might mean for um, ideas around human rights surveillance and power. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's, you mentioned the whole misinformation aspect of it, Kate, and, um, you know, when you look at, uh, there's a lot of uh, people who are in very vulnerable situations, and, and, and oftentimes they are the ones who are more likely to fall for misinformation, right, or, 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 for, or for some sort of gospel that might save them and, 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 and bring them out of suffering, and, and to, to, you know, to then think that now we want to surveil them to try and understand why they they're believing this misinformation is it's just it just sounds like a an infinite death spiral. Um, I mean, if you want to, if you look at COVID, what we saw in the communities up here and in throughout all of Aotearoa was that um, Hapu were taking leadership of looking after their people, looking after their community, and everyone in their community not just some people in the community. And actually that relied on, on data. It relied on them having data. And, and sometimes that data was uh, qualitative. Sometimes that data was collectively possessed, whereas each people, uh, each person in the community knew um, who the Kui and Kaumatu were and where they are and what they might need. And they just sort of came together um, to, solve, to solve a very uh, burning need. And, and I guess in an instance like that, um, you know, where your community isn't made up of a million people in a city, right? It's a couple of hundreds, maybe a thousand or so people in a, in a rural place. You don't need a centralized approach to data collection and surveillance. Actually, these more sort of ad hoc community approaches to data collection and surveillance were, were sufficient enough um, to meet the needs and to ensure that our communities were safe. And so I think that's one thing we need to consider in terms of surveillance is how often is it is centralized necessary um, or can we use these more I guess community-based ways of doing it as we've done you know for generations um, that actually help solve the problems probably in a better way yeah I am um, yeah totoko um, Kioni that's a really good point about um, decentralizing and that is what uh, uh, many people are talking about anyway uh, through blockchain is decentralizing um, that power but also for governments because trust is at the issue isn't it you know like like Kioni was talking about these vulnerable people in all communities there seems to be a tremendous lack of trust around the world um, which makes people like you say prone to believe conspiracy theories or you know so we need to look at that trust and, and it's the government's role, it's private sector, it's all of us, every single one of us, it's our role to start engendering trust in our own communities. And I like the idea of decentralizing data. You know, data is, as they talk about, it's it's the new land. It's not like even oil, it's the new land. And uh, that's how powerful and important it is. Governments need to perhaps start thinking about giving the resources back to the people um, and also the profits that come from that data. So like uh, Kioni again was saying up at Ngāpuhi and, and Taitokero, there was some fantastic um, iwi and hapu approached um, data gathering. It was They could only gather that data because there was trust. 
So, you know, everyone else needs to think about that. And I like what you said as well, Kioni, about that, that say, te tiriti o Waitangi or te ao Māori worldview isn't just good for Māori. It could be good for everybody. Their values of collective cohesion, of um, sustainable futures, everyone cares about that. So, yeah, it's about trust. It's about looking at decentralising and getting the government to release some of its power start sharing some of its power and trusting its citizens to do a job that they and business have quite frankly failed in. Um, and maybe that's how together we bring us all along uh, together, not just one community or some communities, but all of us. Nā mihi, Sara. Um, Thomas, I wanted to bring you back in at this point to think about what you brought up in your opening remarks around the importance of that idea of perception, um, which is an interesting concept when we're thinking about words around surveillance. But the idea that the perception of being surveilled is almost as um, important or significant as the actual act of watching itself um, in terms of this issue that, that all the rest of the panel have raised around trust. Absolutely. Well, we know that people behave differently when they feel they're being watched. And I had a, an interesting case recently where I had someone concerned about what was happening with the electoral roll because they were concerned the electoral roll wanted to know all this information about them, so they had to enrol. But they were saying, but what if I want to vote yes on the um, cannabis referendum? What if someone can track that for me? What if someone can do that? And that person was feeling scared to vote the way they felt they should because they had this perception that that information could be used against them in, in the future. And I think that's just one example of how surveillance, people worrying about surveillance, can really influence um, you know, what they do and what they're going to do. And so, and I think that a lot of people have a tendency to say that, look, surveillance is easy, surveillance is cheap, we should be going for that. But talking about you know, the emergency years of 2020 and COVID and so on, when we started doing that, a lot of people said, oh, we need a technical solution to track everyone in the country, where they're going and who they're meeting and so on. Okay. And there's a lot of excitement about that in the uh, bit. There's a lot of excitement about that. And, um, and some people are saying we had to do this. But of course, as we've seen, we haven't had to do that. We haven't had to have this sort of pervasive tracking and so on. And we've actually recently managed to suppress another outbreak by using a combination of things, including tech, including people tracking, and just doing the work. There's no need to go for the big sort of, okay, government's going to insist that we all do the same thing, and this is the only solution that we have. Yeah, kia ora. I, I think that the example of, of um, the importance of contact tracing, and which has largely been done um, by people using telephones to ring people, which is a terrifying proposition in the year of 2020. I hate telephone calls, they're terrible things. Um, but you know, to get a phone call from the Ministry of Health um, to tell me that my son was a close contact, you know, back in March of one of the early Auckland cases, um, you know, shows the ways in which that person-to-person -person questioning and understanding has actually been the critic one of the critical features of New Zealand's response. Um, it's a sort of anti-tech solution, a slightly Luddite one that actually works um, really well in the New Zealand context. Um, Keone, I love the way that you're also solving the technical problems um, on the chat as well as being a panellist. It's fantastic. Um, I'm wondering... Um. Jess, if there's any questions coming through or if anybody would like to throw a question into the Skype chat, I'm conscious that we've got about 10 more minutes, just over 10 more minutes, and it would be really good to hear from the audience around what their thoughts are in this space. While we're waiting on that, I just wanted to reiterate um, what Sarah mentioned about trust and how incredibly important that is. Um, one of the things we had to do to teach computers te reo Māori was we needed to very quickly uh, build a corpus of data uh, that would help us uh, train uh, machine models. Um, we've been working in the community since 1990 and our 30th birthday is coming up on the 10th of December, very excited. Um, and through the last 30 years, we've been building trust in the community and, and it's because we work in the community, we work with the community, we work for the community in terms of um, uh, uh, you know, providing access to Te Reo Māori, um, uh, you know, providing access to community events through live streaming. And because of that trust that we've built, uh, we were able to collect a corpus of more than 300 hours of labeled data 
in 10 days. In comparison, Mozilla's uh, Common Voice project, um, they got 500 hours, but it took them about five months to get it. Um, and so I think that just shows you when you have that level of trust um, and you have a co-papa that your community support and agree with, getting the data you need to solve problems isn't really an issue. And, and I think we've seen that again with the COVID response, right, in our communities where everyone knew how important it was to share certain information. And as long as we, we trust the sources that are running running it and we understand the co-papa, then then I think I think we can really easily get the data. Can I chime in there, Kate, too? Of course. Yeah, I absolutely total for um, your your comments there, Kione. And I guess to the COVID response as well, I just make a comment in terms of um, something Thomas also alluded to around kind of mandatory um, technologies or surveillance. I think that that kind of hard regulatory intervention or mandating does we know it doesn't do a lot to foster trust particularly with communities who are maybe more likely to distrust interventions from government anyway or are more likely to feel like they are surveilled or targeted and actually the way to do it is um, or one way to consider doing it is to be really transparent and, and clear um, with you know what's going on and, and, and accountable for their actions and their interventions as well. Now, Mahi Jess, um, I think we've had some freezing. I've had a few people freeze, but that's all right. Um, thanks, Eve. Uh, I really, you know, Totoka, this kind of part of the conversation around thinking about what localised, regional, um, iwi hapu or community-based responses look like, because we can actually build from there, as Sarah pointed out earlier, that, you know, starting from the premise of what's good for Māori um, being good for Aotearoa more broadly and, you know, in a really ambitious way to also say probably quite good for the world to, to follow from those um, community-based and community-led responses. Um, we've got a couple of questions from the audience, which I'm going to throw out there. There's so, you saw I was throwing curly questions in, panel. These ones <laughs> are really interesting. So um, great question here around... So, New Zealanders are exporting vast quantities of personal data overseas and via social media companies um, that are, as we know, unelected and have their own policies and ideals. Um, so that data isn't fixable or retrievable. So this is an interesting question. Um, how do we as a country take control and dictate how these companies can use our data? Can we have a response from each of us? Because there's, I can, you know, there's so many ways to answer that, right? And I can see the policy side and the government side. Uh, I think that know, would be the awesome. Side. Yeah. I mean, this is something that, like, we certainly at Take Media are are worried about and care about. Um, we make very conscious decisions in terms of what data we put on Facebook. We're mindful that most of our audience are on Facebook, and if we take the privileged position of saying we're not going to be on Facebook, we actually exclude our very own people. And that just shows you actually who owns the power in that regard, the power over your own people and your own community. Um, it's not you and it's not your community leaders. It's actually, in this case, big tech and Facebook. Um, you know, we would wish we wish we could pull out of Facebook, um, but what's the alternative that we're providing our people? And so unless we can provide them with, with a suitable alternative, they will continue to go to Facebook. I, I'm not a treaty expert, but I do want to mention Y262, and I believe the treaty has made a recommendation of that. Uh, it's, it's really around uh, data privacy and sovereignty, um, and it has been given to the Crown. Obviously, the Crown hasn't acted on it. Maybe Sarah knows more about Y262, but I think, honestly, I think the Treaty of Waitangi, you know, as old as it is, um, can actually solve some of these uh, problems that we're seeing with, with, with um, data privacy and things. We just need a, a Western government to actually listen to it and take their recommendations. Kia ora for that. Um, yeah, I do know Y262, and yes, there is a, um, a case going forward. Clearly, that is going to take time. Um, there is no quick answer to this m massive question, which all of us are talking about, because it's about that ownership and who owns that. That is up to governments who negotiate um, so there's no short, quick fix. 
it's a long game that we're playing. And the thing that I feel to say is that we need to not panic um, about acting quickly. We need to, we, we've only got the systems we've got to uh, find our way through those. Those are legal, those are social. Um, and at the same time, it, this is a multi-layered solution, really. Um, so it's it's high it's high brow in terms of governmental power. It's international um, communication um, relationships, but it's ground level. As Kioni was saying about Tehiku and other Maori and tech, we're trying to grow the capacity um, of tech. Um, in the in Maori society, so that we can deal with this at all levels. But there is no right now. The Google company, uh, the Google companies, the big tech companies are king. They are the new um, colonial power, if you like. And every human being, though, is has the power to do something. Um, you have to make your own personal decisions. Each personal decision counts. Um, and it's also about your own personal values. Again, I say, think about what you're doing today is going to have an effect for the future. What future do you want? You know, it sounds corny. It sounds idealistic, perhaps. But this, you know, we could feel very powerless in, in the face of these big tech giants. But we're not. We can do something um, today. I've struggled with, shall I, shan't I get off Facebook? But it's how I communicate with my daughter and my little grandchildren. Um, what do I do? They watch TikTok. What do I do about that? You know, so it, I think it's already begun. Um, we're already talking about it. As I said before, places like IEEE and the World Economic Forum, they're talking about these things as well. They're well aware of um, the need for diversity and governance. So this is something that's being played out. But I personally don't see a, a, a direct ending to this. Um, in my generation or the next generation. Nama here, Sarah. Um, Eve, Thomas, would you like to contribute to that question around social media giants? Yeah, sure. Um, I can go next if you want. Um, Got it. I mean, I think yeah, everyone's already identified that it's a huge, a huge problem, and there's I think a variety of factors that make it really. Uh, one of those terrible problems to try and fix. You've got firstly the fact that we're all accustomed to providing huge amounts of data to these tech companies because we rely on them in all aspects of our lives. And extricating ourselves from that is actually very difficult now and impossible. I mean, we've seen um, the New York Times come out and do it. A, a lot of work and journalism on how, how you can extricate yourselves and it's just not that feasible. Um, there's also the role of government in terms of uh, both in terms of regulating from a privacy perspective, but then of course from regulating from a markets perspective and a competition perspective. So, um, you know, we do see some work going on in Australia from the ACCC in, in terms of those big four. It'll be really interesting to see where that goes. Um, but yeah, it is a it's a really difficult problem to solve and something that touches on lots of different aspects of. Um, regulatory intervention and consumer choice in, in the market. So it's, it's a big one. Kia ora. Um, Thomas, I would love to hear from you, but also we've got a fantastic question, which will be a great ending question, given that we've got about five minutes left. Okay. Um, so you can throw in your thoughts around the big social media giants into the response to this, which I think would be a fantastic ending question. Um, so somebody has asked us, what's the one thing we people watching can do on Thursday to help move this conversation along? So my very brief remarks as chair would be that to have these kinds of conversations that we're having now in your organisation, be that a government organisation, be that a private organisation, be that an NGO, uh, you'll be surprised at how few people know more broadly outside this select group of people who worry about these things, about these issues. Um, so have these conversations. And don't just have them with your colleagues, you know, raise them in every single meeting, particularly if you're a cis heterosexual white man, raise them, be the voice of, of the pain in the ass in the meeting who always raises them. 
that's my two cents. Thomas, some thoughts. <laughs> okay. What, I, what I'd like to say is I'd like to say for the people who haven't voted, I'd like to say vote for the right party, but unfortunately I'm not sure we have a right party who is really standing up for these issues. Um, and this is the problem for us at the moment. So I guess that maybe if you can't vote for the right party, maybe you can get involved in some of these political parties and start encouraging them to start covering these issues better and start not just kowtowing to what we're seeing from overseas, but actually thinking about a, a proper Aotearoa New Zealand approach to these issues. Kia ora. Feel free to chime in, panel. <laughs> What's the one thing we can do? And um, yeah, I think to Totoko, what you've both said, I think engagement and actually, I guess to hark back as well to Sarah's earlier comments about TTDT, thinking about how partnership works within your organisation is a, is a really a big issue, one that lots of agencies aren't doing very well um, and continuing to consider that um, I think is, is really important. I, yeah, I can I can follow. I guess um, one thing we can do, I mean, in terms of surveillance, um, you know, at your own organizations, ask yourselves, uh, do we need to track demographics of our users? Um, you know, what, what things are you surveilling in your organization? Ask yourself whether you need to do it, whether you can achieve the same results by collecting less data. And that's something that we're trying to think about now in terms of you know, it's so easy to just put a Google Analytics JavaScript on your website, but then you're tracking absolutely everything about your end users and, and just being, you know, taking the challenge really of saying, actually, we can, we can achieve the same results or even do better by tracking less. I think that's, that's really powerful. And if you can do that, then that's great. And please, please share your methods with the rest of us because um, I'm sure we would all love to love to do that. Um, me, right. Okay, sorry, I was very distracted. There's the nurses here telling me I have to go do my COVID test. <laughs> but um, sorry, so what would I say? Uh, again, it's not high tech and it's deeply personal. Like I think I did there on Thursday, even this very minute, sit down and write down what are your values, what drives you, what is your vision for yourself, your family, your community, your job, the country and the world. Really have a good thing. Take a whole hour to really indulge yourself and think about it because that's what's going to make you, that's the sort of the grounding of every decision you make. Um, and I just want to leave with this. I've been working on the text of my kaumatua, Māori Master. Um, and he said, uh, Pākehā technology had the know-how, but what, what is going to make that whole is with Māori, we always knew the know-why. So whatever you're doing, know-how, know-why, and then do it. Kia ora. I don't think we could get a much better ending to a panel than that, to be perfectly honest, but, um, but we've got some more minutes so we can continue to talk. Sarah, um, Thank you so much for your contributions. Do you need to go and have your test now? Uh, I do now as they glare at me. Um, thank you so much for you guys on the panel. Um, I've, I was sick with worry and nerve, nerve about all of this but um, because it's so passionate to me. Um, I really have learned a lot from all your kōrero and I really value Internet um, New Zealand and this NetHui opportunity. So go well. Thank you yeah. so much. Thanks, Thanks, Sarah. Sarah. So lovely to have you. Kakite. Kakite. I think um, we've had some fantastic kōrero uh, today, and it's been amazing to have such excellent panelists, um, Thomas, Eve, Sarah, and Kioni. And I think, um, you know, while the topic that I suggested, um, given that I was handed a topic called surveillance capitalism, we haven't much touched on capitalism because you probably don't want a Marxist feminist historian talking about capitalism. <laughs> um, we, have, we have talked about the intersections between state, governments and power and we've talked about what human rights, which is a sort of global issue, looks like in a particularly 
situated Aotearoa New Zealand context. And I think we've got some really amazing um, starting points for what we can do as individuals, but what we can do as organisations and collectives and as a community of, um, of people who care deeply about the public space that is the internet and, and remembering that um, my sort of final concluding remarks as a historian would be that we were very worried in the 18th century um, when the public sphere opened, when the coffee shops of Europe were filled with people with their pamphlets and their newspapers, um, mainly men, of course, pamphleteers and newspapers writing opinions and then and spreading information. Um, and there was a real fear from states and, and, and church and, and seats of power around what that would do to um, what was at that stage, you know, um, not democracy. But in the end, you know, the pamphleteers who were sometimes really right and sometimes really wrong, it, it all figured itself out. And, and from that kind of many of the beginnings of, of the ways in which media works now emerged. So um, I always think we need to not be too fearful of the power of the tool because we as people have the power to make the tool better. Those would be my concluding remarks. Anything else from um, my panel? Kia ora. Then I think we uh, are all allowed to, um, I'm not quite sure what we're supposed to do, Jess. Do we, do we turn off? What do we do? Just gap it. <laughs> yeah, just, just leave. Yeah. Just leave, oh, leave. Well. You can have a, have a picture of my seat. Yeah. Ka kite. <laughs> Ka kite. Nā mahi nui ki a koe. Hi. Ka koutou katoa.